Okay, welcome to Tuesday, November 2nd, our class session, Math 261, Delta College, Multivariable Calculus. So on our schedule today, just want to help you look ahead for a moment because next week will be your second exam. And I want to draw your attention to some useful handouts on the website. And while I'm doing that, we'll move on in our presentation to cylindrical and spherical coordinates. for multiple integrals. In particular, triple integrals, when you talk about cylindrical and spherical coordinates. And then we're gonna do some applications of integrals and maybe starting today, but uh, maybe only barely starting today and it's not the most important thing on our schedule, so this next section doesn't get the same amount of time others, but basically. <sighs> excuse me. Moments. Centers of mass. And moments of inertia. So this is very common and practical application of multiple integrals. After that, our major topic this week is how to change coordinates in general in multiple integrals. And there, the tool that we're going to use is called the Jacobian, which is a very important tool in both multivariable calculus and differential equations. Uh, in calculus one, your tool was, you know, among other things, but a common tool was U substitution. So you could think of the Jacobian in one way, although it's not sufficient, is to say U substitution on steroids or U substitution blown up into multiple dimensions, but it's a little more detailed than that. So just to look ahead, I want you to remember that exam two is going to be available next week and we'll pop over to our website to take a look at that. We're gonna use the same conditions and instructions that we used on exam one. But I also want you to explore some of our course handouts thoroughly. I've already pointed out that I have some supplemental problems posted and you have the formulas that we collect over time posted, but I wanna make sure that you're paying attention to some of the other material on the website too. So let's shift over there for a few minutes just to make sure everybody's on the same page. And I'm bringing up a browser and I'm seeing some I always see some delays when I pull up this browser. And so I had made a commitment at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, to serve a lot of pages or a lot of handouts over Google Drive. And I haven't been excited with the performance that Google Drive has offered. Um, access, fine. 
but uh, speed of performance is not super duper. And I'm trying to explore exactly why, but so if I pull up things on my website here, I might pull up the local copies on my computer and then share them with you. But let's first of all, look at our schedule. We're in week 10 and you've already had the welcome email this past week. And uh, you have your grade reports, you have your graded papers. Pay particular attention on the graded papers. You'd be very careful how you set your limits on integration. So if you had things that I pointed out in your papers that you had the wrong integrand or the wrong limits on integration, make sure you check the posted solutions to know how you could have done that correctly. But you see, as I slide down to the bottom of my web page here, our homepage, we, the end is near, the end is in sight. And so we're in week 10, and I don't even get to scroll further down this page. I reach the bottom of the page. So pay attention that even though we're just a little bit over the halfway point, the end is gonna come quickly. And particularly remember we have a half week at Thanksgiving. We are in November, unbelievable, but we are in November. And November has that half week at Thanksgiving. So these weeks aren't as full as you might expect. They're gonna go by very fast. Next week is review in exam two. So dedicated to reviewing problems and you working on exam two. You tell me what you need to work on exam two, what you'd like to review. But then we'll open up our last chapter, which is chapter six which is the full vector theorems of integration that basically were the great successes of Newton, Leibniz, Maxwell. This is where calculus started, explaining three-dimensional phenomenon and then building the machine that explained it. That's what Newton and Leibniz did principally. Well, among many other very useful things. But if we look into week 10 here, so we're talking about triple integrals and cylindrical and spherical coordinates, mass, moments of inertia, and most important, change of variables and multiple integrals. You have your homeworks posted, and you're going to have time without homework to work on your exams, just as you did in the first exam. But look at some of the handouts. I want you to pay attention to the formula sheets. I'm not gonna pull them up, but where we collect the formulas that we're using in these units. Uh, for this exam, I, some of the sample exam problems may be passed, but other exam problems and multiple integral problems, you should definitely look at. I've got problems and solutions of some interesting problems there. Talking about cylindrical and spherical coordinates, I give a famous example right here called polar cap. I might pull that up. Uh, here's a formula sheet three, by the way. So we're going to talk about average value. We've already done that, but then how does that relate to mass, center of mass? We're going to remember the spherical and cylindrical coordinate systems. And here is the famous Jacobian. That looks like a very complicated object, but it's really not as bad as it looks. And that shows you how to do coordinate transformations of integrals over any region in plane and space. So that's formula sheet three. We're not quite into formula sheet four. So you might be consuming just formula sheets one through three. Polar cap here is a nice example of executing an integral in cylindrical coordinates and principally trying to execute it efficiently. I like the fact that you guys are digging into mathematics and so forth, but it's not a replacement for knowing how to integrate things. So that was the purpose of Calc 2 is to show you a lot of interesting integral techniques. And I might remind you of some of the more exotic ones as we go along in the next couple of days. But pay particular attention to any problem in the book that talks about integrating spheres or portions of spheres. 
And the reason why is because in any kind of physical problem, you've got a lot of symmetry going on. Many physical problems have cylindrical or more commonly spherical symmetry. So if you're able to work with spheres very directly, then you have a great advantage. So you might wonder why there's so many problems in double and triple integrals about spheres. It's because spheres kind of rule the universe, so to speak, as far as our notion of what it means to have distance or separation or inverse square laws in physics. So this is just a demonstration of an efficient way to do a sample sphere problem. I want you to go on and I want to point out two other samples I have. Here's an integration of an ice cream cone. But this other thing is an interesting article from an old science magazine, a surfing article. And let me see if I can pull that up. Zoom, 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 zoom. I'm trying to look for a local copy so I don't have to wait for the thing to load. Oh, it, okay, it loaded pretty quickly. This is a 2017 Science Magazine article that I just posted, not the whole issue of the magazine, but there was this fun article in here about creating the perfect wave. So, Someone really enjoyed surfing, said, hmm, I got to build myself a surfing tank. And so if you read this article that they did is they set up a pool somewhere. I forgot where. We'll have to look at the article where by the contours of the base of the pool and the system of pumping water, they created a relatively realistic wave tank. So I'll let you read this article at your leisure, but this is a picture of the wave tank right here. It's a diagram of the wave tank. And from the side, they're bringing in water, just like pumping it, like you push water around with your hands when you're in a sink or a tub. But down here at the bottom is a smaller version of the whole tank where they showed you how they use the contours of the bottom. I can't blow that up any larger than that. I apologize. Use the contours of the bottom to create and dissipate the waves. So you might see this as a contour map of a surface level curves. So this is how they set this up to create certain kind of waves. It's just a fun read. And I thought it was an interesting application because you don't hear people talking about contour maps every day out there necessarily in the real world, but I thought you might enjoy reading that. Okay, here's an ice cream cone example I want you to look at. Again, it's about using spherical and cylindrical coordinates because many, many things you run across have a type of circular symmetry, symmetry about a point or symmetry about an axis. So here's another example of an integration you might be interested in. I'm gonna back out of there. So uh, two other things or three other things I want to draw your attention to, excuse me. And that is reduction formulas. Wallace's formula and center of mass. So center of mass is a handout I've set up for you to introduce the idea of center of mass. Maybe you've used it before, but the idea is very simple. It's balancing things left, right, front, back, up, down. And you can travel from you know, balancing point masses to balancing continuous masses very, very simply with a multiple integral. So when you have the chance, I want you to go through this handout. I may even reference it uh, maybe at the end of today, maybe tomorrow. But the idea of how you naturally balance things and the introduction of the word moment. 
So you can take any number of masses of any number of sizes, and you can easily balance them and find the center of mass. Well, and so you should be able to do with a rod or a wire of variable density. And then after that, you can extend this to a plate. And then after that, you can extend this to a volume. So this handout will get you started. Maybe we'll reference it later today. Speaking about integrating things efficiently, very often when you work in cylindrical or spherical coordinates, you create sines and cosines, powers of sines and cosines. And in your experience in calculus one, you integrated powers of sines and cosines often that were mixed together in convenient ways, but outright powers of sines and cosines, you don't evaluate every day, especially the higher powers. In the back of your calculus book, you would have had a table of integrals. And among them would be these famous reduction formulas. And the reduction formulas are valuable in their own right because they communicate patterns to you to help you evaluate higher powers of sines and cosines but it's actually executing them where you can see the patterns in a more powerful and direct way. So here's examples of how to write out what a reduction formula do for you. But you call it a reduction formula because it moves the sixth power of sine to the fourth power of sine, the fourth power of sine to the third, second power of sine. The reduction formula is because they reduce the powers of the integrand kind of one step at a time. This is how it looks if you write them out. But when you get done and you visualize the patterns, then you get some very simple to execute patterns in the powers of sines and cosines. You say, this is not simple to execute. This is terrible to look at these extra powers of sines and cosines. But I want you to think about something and that is usually when you're talking about circular symmetry, you're commonly working over what intervals? Like a zero to two pi, that means you make a full circle, or a zero to pi, a half circle, or even sometimes a zero to pi over two, a quarter circle. Now with those being the common intervals, when you're evaluating integrals with sines and cosines in them, then you suddenly realize, wait a minute, sine and cosines values at zero, at pi over two, at pi, at two pi, those are very friendly values, often of zero and one and minus one. So there's another reason why they're called the reduction formulas. Over the proper intervals, almost all of these terms, usually all but the last term, drop out. And you get very interesting patterns in the integrals of sines and cosines. So this handout, reduction formula handout, is worth playing with. If you need a reduction formula, you look it up when you need it. But you can find out some very useful relationships when you encounter the higher powers of sine and cosine integrals. Uh, sine and cosine most commonly, sometimes secant, cosecant, sometimes tangent. But uh, sine and cosine are the principal things you encounter higher powers of. So make sure to check out that handout called the reduction formulas. Now with that handout called the reduction formulas, there is something called Wallace's formula for pi which is also worth remembering, not because you need a formula for pi over two. In fact, this is kind of a, among formulas for pi, a bad formula for pi. Bad in that it's not very accurate very quickly, but it is a goofy little expression for pi. Look at this expression for pi. Well, frequently, the formulas like this are not pi directly, but pi over two. So that's as, that's as good as pi if you double both sides. 
This formula was discovered by Wallace in 1656. But what's interesting about it is the beauty and the symmetry. Look at the pi over two is equal to not an infinite sum, but an infinite product. One, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, etc. If you take that product forever, and you actually produce pi over two. That's not a practical way to produce pi over two. But why it's interesting is because this formula comes from the reduction formulas. It comes from integrating powers of sine and cosine. So this handout is not required for you to do your work in this class, but I wanted to show you and very obscure and old uh, application of integrals of sine and cosine. And sometimes this turns out to be really useful. So I want you to read on this paper in front of you now. Do you see the integral from pi zero to pi over two of sine to the seventh power is just two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if you had to perform the definite integral, well, of course you can go and show me every step by the reduction formulas. But if you knew Wallace's formula and you knew the reduction formula's output, like I said, many things drop out when you're using friendly limits like zero, pi over two and pi. Then you know exactly how much area is under sine to the seventh power from zero to pi over two. It's just two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever that number is. And for even powers of sine, it is similar. It's one, two, three, four, five, six times pi over two. Even powers of sine will incorporate pi over two, odd powers of sine will not. So this is directly the result of the reduction formulas. And Wallace used this to demonstrate this funny formula for pi. This is not a practical formula for pi, but I just wanted to show you how someone used this in a clever way. So if you have some time and you want to read something interesting, you can look at this handout. Okay, so I was taking you through formula sheets that I want you to examine, uh, look at some sample problems and other exam problems, multiple integral problems, and then some interesting handouts illustrating uh, cylindrical and spherical co uh, coordinate integration. Interesting article from Science Magazine. Interesting demonstration of cylindrical and spherical coordinate transformation again. And then something that we might use when we do odd integrals, reduction formulas, and demonstration of how to introduce center of mass. Okay, so that is just the uh, extended tour of some of the things that we're talking about here in the near future. So I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go over to cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Uh, I'm a little bit sensitive to the fact that when someone just throws a pile of handouts at you and and says, here, read these, that they're throwing a pile of extra reading at you. Uh, you read and do what you need to read and do. Uh, some of those handouts might speed your work. So don't overlook that possibility. So let's talk about triple integrals. Let's talk about cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So remember, when I write a triple integral in the most general form, integrate over a solid, contribution of a function to volume, then I am making no commitment to a coordinate system. I'm just saying that I have three-dimensional space here. And where, where do I say that I have three-dimensional space? Principally in the dv or in the function of x, y, and z. But notice I didn't write x, y, and z because I didn't want to make a commitment 
to what coordinate system I was using. But you know that X, Y, and Z space can be described There's some generic potato in space. I like to use the analogy of a potato because it's something you, you, know, you pick up, you hold in your hand and you dice into little tiny pieces sometimes when you're in the kitchen. So you're cutting up that potato in space into little volume pieces. And the first natural way by your coordinate system learning the first natural way to cut up that potato into little pieces is little cubes. dx by dy by dz. <coughs> that creates a little volume piece. And the purpose of the triple integral, remember every definite integral is a length, area, a volume, or a contribution of a function there too, is to on every little volume piece, Check out the value of the function and then add up some of the values of those functions over all those little pieces. And the value of the function might represent temperature, it might represent density, it might represent value in terms of money or resources. It could re represent many, many things. But by the shape of the potato, sometimes rectangular coordinates are not the most effective way to cut something up. So we're used to thinking by our initial training in rectangular coordinates. And then we set these limits here in terms of outside to in, z equals y equals and x equals. Since I don't want to make any commitments, I'll just say g for potato, which means I'm setting the limits to match the potato or the solid that I'm examining. But we've already said that sometimes instead of x and y, it's more convenient to speak in the plane about polar coordinates. So we've already investigated replacing dx dy with dr d theta. But we also learned there was a price for doing that. We had to introduce a factor of r, a proportionality constant, to describe the dA in terms of r and theta. Now remember in cylindrical coordinates, the z represents going up and down the elevator the same way it does in rectangular coordinates. So actually, you can move easily from cylindrical, uh, from polar coordinates to cylindrical just by saying that cylindrical coordinate transformation is just changing the x and y into polar coordinates and leaving the z untouched. And when you do such a thing, when you replace x and y with r and theta equivalents, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, then you also have to do that in the expression of the function. And I did not leave myself an excellent amount of space, did I? r cosine theta, r sine theta, but the z stays the same. And you have to pay a price for leaving rectangular coordinates, but you've already paid it with the R. So this is a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates. And we'll give demonstrations in a second. And then maybe that cylindrical symmetry is what? Circular symmetry with an elevator, the z axis. But there's a full powered super circular symmetry in three dimensions, and it's more properly called spherical symmetry. It depends on two angles. 
but you're thinking of things made out of balls. So in spherical coordinates, you'd like to think about rho phi and theta. Well, what would you have to replace x, y, and z with? We talk about rho and phi and theta. Well, remember the little table you made for yourself when you're making coordinate transformations, or remember that triangle message we gave you, the triangle in the tabletop and the triangle standing up on the table. First, x and y turn in r cosine theta and r sine theta, and z stays the same. That's using this triangle, r, y, x, theta. But then you can also look at r as a piece of another triangle, r, z, phi, and rho. So this triangle relates x and y to r and theta. Excuse me, I have to move the paper up and get ready to tear it off. First triangle relates x to r and theta. Second triangle relates r and z to rho and phi. And using this triangle, you replace the z. z over rho is r sine phi. Uh, excuse me. I got to write this almost every time to make sure I write it correctly. Think in their terms of a ratio. Z over rho is the cosine of phi. So Z is rho cosine phi. R over rho is sine phi. Paper bent at an angle here, not interfering with my writing, excuse me. So R is rho sine phi, and that replaces these two R's right here. Rho sine phi cos theta, rho sine phi sine theta. Uh, sometimes people write the thetas first. R or rho cos theta sine phi, rho sine theta sine phi, either way is the same. So if you ever are unsure about your transformation, just write down this little table and travel from x to rho phi and theta in this manner. So you're gonna replace x with rho sine phi cosine theta. Now I really don't have any room to write. Rho sine phi sine theta and rho cosine phi in this triple integral. You can describe G with respect to the rho phi and theta. Theta, angle from the positive x-axis in the plane. Phi, angle from the positive z-axis in the space. And rho, distance from the origin. But you need to pay for that transformation. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is what we're going to demonstrate fully next time. But we'll just tell you what the payment is, just like we told you what the payment is for R. If you switch from rectangular to spherical coordinates, you have to insert a factor of rho squared sine phi. Again, I can make the same proportionality and three-dimensional proportionality argument for dv in this case. But I'd rather give you the full technical argument next time and not just rely on a reasonable drawing, although the book makes a nice drawing of this in this section. So I just summarize in rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. You're using a different 
dv in each case. And these are the dVs. The r and the rho squared sine phi turn out to be the Jacobian for these coordinate systems. Rho, phi, and theta. And the other thing I remind you of is you are allowed to change the order of these. In fact, sometimes you get a great advantage by changing the order of integration. But these modification factors, these change of coordinate factors, they're always present, no matter what order you switch on here. Okay, so we're gonna take something out, just do a simple problem, cylindrical or spherical coordinates, just to get an idea of what it means to execute these. And remember, we change coordinate systems. Why? Usually to simplify limits of integration. Simplify the integrand. or to simplify both. Okay. Excuse me. Get ready to move that paper out of the way. And I'm just gonna pick some reasonable problem out of here and see where we're gonna go with this. I don't want to pick something that's too simple, but maybe something that's reasonably simple to start with or something that has an interesting result to start with. Yeah, let's look at number 259. This is in section 5.5. A kind of a very geometrical thing to start with. So let's find the volume of solid E. He uses E for his generic solid label, bounded by cone x squared plus y squared square rooted is Z and the plane one is Z. So this is about kind of the simplest figure I could imagine starting with other than the cylinder itself. So let's look at this drawing and then decide what coordinate system we should use. Now, Remember z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. If you block out this y or x, if y or x is zero, then it just reduces to z is plus or minus x or plus or minus y. You know that this is a cone 45 degrees from the vertical, plus minus x plus minus y in both coordinate systems. And here drawing is drawing more is too much. Less is more when you're drawing this. So let's just draw a generic cone like this. Uh, bounded by that positive part of the cone only and Z equals one. Let's make this height right here one. That means I'm cutting off the cone at this plane right here. So what's the volume of this cone? I know in general that the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h, where h is the height. This is a right circular cone, but you can use this for 
any circular cone. It doesn't have to be necessarily perpendicular axis or centered or symmetrical about an axis. But right circular cone such as we have here, one third pi r squared h. So here my radius at the base is also one because if z is one, then x squared plus y squared square rooted is one. So x squared plus y squared is one. So the shadow cast by this cone in the plane, it's valuable to think about the shadow that the solid casts is a circle of radius one. So what I have here is radius one, height one. So there should be no surprises about the volume of this solid. It should be one third pi. How would we write it? Cylindrical, spherical, or rectangular? Well, a rectangular is a distraction because I have to draw a little crosshairs on this shadow based, the circle shadow right here, and then shoot through the cone. over this whole circular base. And I describe that circular base, I have to pick one coordinate X or Y. Let's pick X. I have to visualize X being from minus one to one. And then for each X, I have to visualize Y running from bottom of circle to top of circle. Out here on the side, if X runs from minus one to one, then y ranges from bottom of circle to top of circle. And that would be circle of radius one, minus one minus x squared, one minus x squared, positive square rooted. And then I have to enter the solid on this cone, which is z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. And I exit the solid at this height of one, means upper minus lower limit, looks like this. Now this is integral with respect to y on the inside, x on the outside. And you say, that's not a triple integral. It is in rectangular coordinates, but it is triple integral if I use these things to make the limits for the z variable, right? Sometimes more convenient to think in another level of integral. So what I'm really doing is integrating with respect to x from minus one to run, integrating with respect to y from minus root to plus root, and integrating with respect to z from one excuse me, from cone to one, from cone, and that cone is the square root of x squared plus y squared. That's where I enter and I exit at z equals one. Remember all these are equations, x equals one, x equals minus one, y equals root, y equals minus root, z equals one, z equals this root. This is rectangular coordinates, and it could be executed just as you see it, but I'm not going to bother dealing with all these roots. I'm going to go straight to cylindrical, because in cylindrical, all these things can be expressed much more efficiently. I'm going to write down three integrals. I am not sure where I should go with this. You know, dr and d theta usually stick together. Sometimes you do dr d theta and sometimes you do d theta dr. But whether you put the dz on the back or the front, that sometimes depends on the problem. Here I put z on the inside. So why don't I think like that again? Why don't I try blocking this thing out with respect to theta? Theta is the easiest variable to describe right here in a way. This cone lives from theta equals zero to two pi. And then for each theta, I choose an r, a distance that I go out from the origin. And for every theta, the r is the same, zero to one. That's convenient. 
And then as far as Z goes, instead of going from cone to one, well, one is very convenient, but the cone is square root of X squared plus Y squared. Square root of R squared, the cones entering is also at R. So you go out R and you enter at R. That's a right triangle. So here's the same integral in cylindrical coordinates. And we don't forget the price we have to pay for switching. This integral is much, much easier to execute. We'll execute this kind of quickly. Remember, integrate z, integrate r, the constant with respect to z, then what you have right here. I'll try not to skip steps while I'm evaluating. Is you have rz from z equals r to z equals 1. If you need help knowing what variable you're dealing with, reminding yourself, reminding yourself that you're putting r and 1 in for z, you go ahead and write that. But putting one in here gives me r, putting r in here gives me r squared, r minus r squared, zero to two pi, zero to one, dr d theta, integrate this with respect to r, one half r squared minus one third r cubed, from zero to one d theta, the zero to one belongs to the R because I'm doing the R integration, but I don't see anything else that I get confused by. Excuse me, moving the paper up zero to two pi. And now notice the value of the one and the zero, putting in a one gives me a half minus a third, which is a sixth. Putting in a zero gives me nothing. So I get a sixth integrated from zero to two pi. And always look out for constants like this. And they don't always occur at the end. Sometimes they occur at the beginning. But this is a brick. Understand that this is a brick of height one sixth from zero to two pi. This is a brick of area one sixth times two pi. And that's the one third pi. Okay, so this is why we switch coordinate systems. We want to go from awkward presentation and evaluation to simple presentation evaluation. But you could say, oh, you were just doing polar coordinates. I could have done polar coordinates on this double integral I wrote here. So this is not a very impressive presentation yet. It's just a first presentation. Notice you could also write this in spherical coordinates. Although I am not sure I want to evaluate that spherical coordinates. So before we take a break, let me at least write this in spherical coordinates. You can write anything almost in any coordinate system. Sometimes you might need multiple batches of integrals to do it, but your goal is to write things in the simplest coordinate system. So let's think what it would take to express this in terms of rho, phi, and theta. Well, I have to think about the order too, don't I? So the order, I still believe theta is an effective way to start because I got to bring this back into the picture here, excuse me, because this thing is still described most generally by saying it circles the z-axis. It is from zero to two pi. So check off the theta. Between the rho and phi, what should I work with next? Well, the phi is also the same for every point around the z-axis. This cone is phi from zero to pi over two. I'm uh, sorry, pi over four. Every theta I pick, I dip from zero to pi over four to reach the outer wall of that cone. I bend down pi over four units from the z-axis. And so this looks kind of friendly. You know, I had constant limits a second ago. 
I still got constant limits here. But it's the row that may not be entirely in my favor here. Now let's think about integrating with respect to row. In the picture, I have to shoot row from the origin to the exit place. And the exit place is the plane z equals one. But z is not in spherical coordinates. So I'd have to change z equals one to spherical coordinates. Now let's go get our spherical coordinate chart. That's okay, z is rho cos phi. So this plane right here is rho cos phi. And I can describe that in terms of rho. Rho is one over cosine phi or secant of phi. I don't know if I want to get fancy with secant stuff, but I could say every row shoots from zero to one over cos phi. And it's that limit, you know, if I have my choice between r to one and zero to one over cos phi, I think I might prefer the r to one. But don't give up on this limit here yet. Remember now you have to pay for the privilege of changing the spherical coordinates, rho squared sine phi. Remember you're integrating a one. When you do the volume integral, you're integrating a one over the three dimensions, like you're integrating over two dimensions, upper minus lower. Let's get this paper entirely out of my way. So maybe in this integration here, I get a break with the one over cosine phi. Before we take a break ourselves, maybe I should just uh, not give up on it too early. Let's investigate this. Let's integrate this with respect to phi, uh, with respect to rho, excuse me. Then I get one third rho cubed sine phi. And I have to evaluate that from rho equals zero to rho equals secant phi. I'll stick with the one over cosine phi just so I can mix it in here. Then I have to do, if I survive that, d phi d theta, which is two nice integrals with constant limits. So putting in zero give me nothing here. Putting in one over cosine phi give me a cosine cubed on the bottom. So now I'm looking at one third sine phi cosine cubed phi e phi e theta zero to pi over four zero to two pi. And by u substitution, maybe this is not such a bad deal. Let's let u equal cosine phi. Then du is minus sine phi d phi or minus du is sine phi d phi. And here's my sine phi d phi. I can replace that with a minus u du over u to the third power or u to the minus three power. Now notice my du right here, my theta integral is still zero to two pi. I'm not going to change the u limits, and that's just a habit. I'm going to remind myself that this is phi is zero to pi over four. You can change limits as long as you do it carefully because you got to make sure you're talking about a one to one function. But it's safer just to execute the u substitution and then put back the phi in many cases. This is u to the minus two. And when I differentiate this, I get a minus two power come out. Here's the minus sign, but I got to kill the two. One half. Don't forget the one third that was out here in front of this. So I need a one third in front of this. 
And let's just check our differentiation. When I differentiate this, minus two comes out fried, two kills the one half of the minus sign survives. And I get minus one third u or du over u cubed. Good. And then I'll put back what phi was. So this is one sixth. And this is one over cosine squared phi. And this is evaluated from phi equals zero to pi over four. This is certainly a little more heavy lifting. And then I integrate from zero to two pi. That should be friendly. Plugging in pi over four gives me a cosine of one over root two <coughs> squared is one over two. And the reciprocal of that is two. So when I plug in pi over four, I get two over six. When I plug in, I'm going to make sure I've got a minus sign to see. When I plug in zero, well, let's just go with this and see what adjustment I have to make. When I plug in zero, I get cosine is one, one over one. And one over one is one, and this is a one sixth. And I'm subtracting. I like my numbers, but I don't like my signs. So I'm nervous that I lost the sign. Let's check this out in a second. E theta from zero to two pi. I said I like my numbers because this is minus one six times two pi, which is minus one third pi. Well, I don't like that number. I don't like the minus sign. So I'm kind of curious, where did I lose? a minus sign as I was working in here. So let's read this from the top. If you see where I dropped my minus sign, you're welcome to throw that in the chat as well. But here's my sign over cosine cubed. Here's my substitution. Here's my U substitution differentiation. Put a minus sign in here. And somehow I believe that minus sign got eight by this integration, which seemed to make sense. But if that's the case, then where did the minus sign go? Oh, okay, here, good. Minus sign, all good. What I did is subtracted badly. One third is bigger than one six. Let's write that 100 times. One third is bigger than one six. One third minus one six is positive one six. Positive one six times two pi, positive pi over three. Okay, so we did execute this in spherical coordinates, but I think for this cone, cylindrical coordinates was king, in particular because of this cap, which was described easily in terms of Z and not as easily in terms of spherical coordinates. Okay. I got to come back and do a real spherical coordinate problem, not just a uh, unnecessarily complicated one, but we're going to take a break first. So let's come back at, oh, let's call it 907. And we'll move on to cylindrical coordinate example. I'm going to just mute my microphone for five minutes and stretch my legs. And you, I invite you to do the same.
Okay, we're back. And we're going to move on to more interesting examples of spherical coordinates. So I want to show you, I'll, I'll show you a common example and then a more interesting example. So uh, we're looking at uh, two problems in this section. And I'll take exercise 285, which is a kind of a common example. And then exercise 282, which might be a more fun example. Now, here's what I mean by common. And let's do exercise 285. But I'm not going to do it fully, or maybe I will, because it might seem like too easy. And let me tell you why it might seem like too easy, but let's uh, write down this zero to four, zero to square root of 16 minus x squared. And then you ask, what is the value of it if it's so easy? This makes the problem too easy. We have to address that. And that's one reason why I'm bringing this example. So here's a thing that's done in uh, rectangular coordinates. It looks like a big mess. And then they want to add more mess to it. X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared squared. DZ, DY, DX. OK, so. We need to recognize that this is crying for spherical coordinates. It's looking for spherical coordinates because it's made out of spheres. You know, the x squared plus y squared plus z squared, excuse me, is rho squared in spherical coordinates. But even here, when we draw this, what is zero to four, zero to root, and minus root to root here in x, y, and z coordinates? Well, it turns out to be some portion of a sphere. We go from zero to four on the x-axis. But remember, that's why you need to focus on this. This is x equals zero to x equals four. Those are two planes. So that's blocking this thing off. But now we look at y equals zero to y equals the square root. Well, y equals the square root. If you square both sides, you get y squared is 16 minus x squared. You get x squared plus y squared is 16. And that is a circle of radius four. So for every x, y goes from zero to circle. So when x is 4, I get y go from 0 to 0. When x is 0, I get y go from 0 to root 16, which is 4. OK, so there's my x and y coordinates. And now z is going to go from negative root to positive root. But by the same token, when you square both sides, this says x squared plus y squared plus z squared, after you bring these variables to the left-hand side, is equal to 16. So this is a sphere of radius 4. And the minus to the plus means you go from top to bottom. So what are we integrating over here? We're integrating over a quarter of an orange, or a quarter of an apple. which I don't draw beautifully. Maybe the machine would draw it better for me. But I'm image, it's like I took a ball, an orange is a good thing, and I cut it into force with a knife from above. That's this one quarter of an orange, and I didn't draw it beautifully. 
So anything that's a piece of a ball is going to be better represented commonly in spherical coordinates. And the bonus is, so does this function. Even if the function was ugly, this the limits themselves call for spherical coordinates. So I don't know which way to go with this, but d rho d phi d theta is a common thing. Let's try it and see if it works. Theta here goes from zero to pi over two. Rho, I'm always shooting through this orange slice from zero to edge of ball. An edge of ball is four units away. The rho goes from zero to four. Oh, okay, rho does go from zero to four, but I haven't discussed phi yet. Phi for this ball goes from zero to pi over two. At every theta I pick, I am going from the North Pole to the South Pole, zero to pi, excuse me, in phi land. And then for every rho and phi, I will shoot from zero to four to go from this origin to the edge of the ball. Okay, don't be in a hurry. I have to include a rho squared sine phi to pay for spherical coordinates. And I also have to change this to rho squared squared. So I actually have several powers of rho, sine phi, and then d rho d phi d theta. But as far as these coordinates go, this is a friendly integration. So write it neatly here, zero to pi over two, zero to pi, zero to four, rho six, sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Actually, this is such a quick integration. I don't think it's a very exciting problem, but let's just execute it. So with respect to rho, you get one seventh rho to the seventh. And when you plug in four, you get that value four inside that row. And when you plug in zero, you get nothing. So what I get is one seventh, four to the seventh, sine phi. And then I'm going to integrate that from zero to pi over two, zero to pi, d phi d theta. Now here's something you should pay attention to. Next, I integrate from zero to pi of sine phi, but let's just talk about sine. You know that from zero to pi over two, I'm sorry, zero to two pi, the integral of sine is zero because I have same above and below. But do you know what one node of a sine is worth? Equal sizes, zero integral from zero to two pi, but from zero to pi, what is one node or one bump of sine worth? And the answer is the area is two. I want you to go and verify that, but I do not necessarily want to say, okay, sine comes from minus cosine, minus cosine, let's put in pi, let's put in zero, let's subtract the two. I'm going to screw up my signs if I do that. But if I can just read this, oh, this is one bump of sine from zero to pi. Then I can just read that as one seventh, four to the seventh times two. Now you see the value of that because this is just a constant height of a brick over the interval zero to pi over two. So the integral of that is one seventh four sevenths, two to the pi over, two times pi over two. So when we're done, this is one seventh, four to the seventh times pi. And I'll evaluate that in a second. 
But I want to show you that what I did with my spherical coordinates was more than making the limits nice and the integrand nice. It made the evaluation nice because I can use common facts about sines and cosines. And then if I got into more trouble, I could use common facts about the powers of sines and cosines. And that's why I showed you the reduction formulas. So don't be afraid to use time-saving measures like this. Okay, so now what is four to the seventh? That would be two to the 14th and two to the 10th, everybody should understand that two to the 10th is 1028. So what's two to the 14th? Oh, I don't even want to think about it. I got to do uh, 16 times that. You know what? I'll let you work on that. That wasn't the main point of this exercise, but you could look up the value there. Now that is not the volume of this orange slice, remember. That is the contribution of this function to that volume of orange slice. And this function gets rather large as you go out to rho equals four. So you get 16 and then 16 squared, you get 256, contribution of 256 on these outer edges. That's quite large. Okay, but that's just a common way. And you say, well, that was easy because it was a sphere. And I say, you're thinking backwards when you talk like that. Show me a more interesting example. That was too easy, Dave, because it was a sphere. And I say, you're talking backwards. It wasn't easy because it was a sphere. The fact that it was made out of spheres made me do this transformation, which made it easy. So when do you use spherical coordinates? When you have spherical symmetry. You naturally don't use spherical coordinates on a cube, right? So don't complain that I picked an easy example. No, I picked an example made out of spheres. Let's pick another example made out of spheres, which is not so obvious. Yeah, so of course you're not gonna pull out spherical coordinates if you don't have things made out of spheres. But many, many problems, physics, gravity, electromagnetism, intensity of light or radiation are based on what? Distance from one point to another. And what is distance from one point to another naturally expressed as? As a sphere. The set of all points that's four units away from the origin is a sphere of radius four. So spherical symmetry appears all over the place. Anyway, here's something you got to think about a little more carefully. Find the volume of the solid I love G for my solids. He loves E, but he didn't say E, so I'm going to be free to use my own letter. Outside the sphere of radius one centered at origin. And the equation of that is rho equals one. And inside the sphere, rho equals cosine phi. Four, then he makes his last disclaimer, phi from zero to pi over two. Okay, what is this? 
what does this look like? Well, first thing I say is he's inviting us to use spherical coordinates because he described the thing in spherical coordinates. And maybe this can't be described any other way. Now, sphere radius one, you say, ah, I know how to do that in rectangular coordinates or cylinder coordinates. But this is fully expressed in spherical coordinates. We got to understand this. And then here's the restriction on phi right here. So we had to spend some time drawing those. So I remind you that circles came in three useful flavors in the plane. X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. That's circle centered to the origin. But in the plane, circles could also be just kissing the Y axis or Just kissing the x-axis sometimes, and this is back to your polar coordinate days in trigonometry and calculus. Say, sometimes it was useful to set a circle off center so that it touched the origin instead of being centered at the origin. And this, if this was an A right here, was R equals A cosine theta. And this, if you have an A right here, is R equals A sine theta. So you have to remember these two expressions of circle that were equally valuable to this. I could write this in rectangular coordinates. I could write either one of rectangular coordinates, but polar coordinates made this easier to look at. Now we can also do this for spheres. So standard expression of a sphere is A sphere of radius rho, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals rho squared. That's a circle. I'm sorry, a sphere of radius rho. But I could decide to set the sphere on top of the origin instead of centered at the origin. And in that case, trying to draw something of about the same size, and I'm not great at drawing circles, so it means I'm not great at drawing spheres, I get something like this, a ball or a globe sitting on the origin. Now, by the analogy that we used here, and, and you can do this with your triangles and so forth, but I just, tell you that the equation of this sphere, if it reaches up to A, is A cosine phi. So you use your triangles and your trigonometry, you could describe this sphere in this fashion. And this is what we see right here. Now, pay attention that the radius of this circle is A over 2. In both cases, the radius of the sphere is A over 2. The diameter is A. So the number in front of here is not radius, it's diameter. Diameter, diameter. So when I see rho cosine phi, what I see is a sphere that sits on the origin, reaches up to 1, and therefore has a diameter of 1 and a radius of 1 half. <coughs> so now, say in Oh, what about this sphere of radius one? So what I have here, and I'm gonna draw it myself in a bigger picture so we can look at it. What I have here is a sphere of radius one centered at the origin, swallowing a sphere of radius one half standing on the origin. Let's draw that more carefully. So uh, I wanted to draw it a little bit larger, but I'm not making it very large, am I? Well, we'll just try to draw neatly. So I have a sphere of diameter one standing on top of the origin. B 
being swallowed by a sphere of radius one, centered at the origin. Try to indicate the three dimensionalness by drawing the equator. So this sphere is rho equals one. And this red sphere is rho equals cosine phi. And now one more restriction. Remember, they said phi is only running from zero to pi over two. So where is that in this problem? Pi over two, angle from the vertical. So it's going down from the North Pole, the Z axis, the positive Z axis, pi over two, 90 degrees to the X, Y plane. So in the end, I want this upper hemisphere, but I wanna take out this ball. Now let's think about that. The black upper hemisphere minus the ball. By volume, this is easy to compute because I know my geometry formulas. But let's think about it in terms of X, Y, and Z shooting through here, you know, intersphere, exit sphere from the tabletop, big mess. Even in terms of rho, phi, and theta, this is not convenient. But since it's made out of spheres, I might hope that it can be easily described in spherical coordinates. Even that is, uh, I'm thinking about it. I'm not super duper convinced. Well, let's look at it. Before we look at it, let's work out what it should be actually, right? The outer sphere is a sphere of radius one. So that's four thirds pi one cubed, but I only want the upper half of it, and that's one half times that. The inner sphere is the red sphere, and this has a radius of one half, four thirds pi one half cubed. And you say, oh, that's the same thing. No, 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 here the one half is inside the cube. So what if I got, if I do this, what volume should I have? So I have two thirds pi, that's this expression. And here I have one eighth times four thirds. This is, so this is minus four over eight is one over two, one sixth pi. Four six minus one six is three six, which is one half. So this whole mess should be pi over two. That's what we should see when we evaluate it. Well, let's see what we can get. I'm gonna keep this picture in here, although I'm a little bit unhappy I should have drawn this picture larger, but let's just deal with it. Let's set up the triple integral. Volume, let's try. Theta first, phi second, rho last. That's not uncommon when you're dealing with spherical symmetry that you do theta phi and then rho. Uh, don't forget that we have to pay for it with rho squared sine phi. But other than that, I'm multiplying by one. I'm just doing volume. So limits. Theta from zero to two pi. Yes, this thing is just circling the z-axis. That's not surprising. Phi limits. To scope out this weird bubble in a ball, I'm only living from phi equals zero to pi over two. So that's also constant limits. It's the row I have to be careful about. And this is not immediately obvious. Let me pull out another color. When I shoot through this thing from origin to edge, where am I entering my solid and where am I exiting my solid? Or better, where am I exiting the bubble and entering the solid? And then where am I exiting the solid? What happens since I'm only using phi's 
about pi over two. Do you see I always start out inside the bubble? And I spend some time in the black solid, or I spend a lot of time in the black solid. Let's say if I was all the way down to pi over two, then I spend the entire time in the black solid. But other than that, I'm always in the bubble for a short time. So this tells me that as I fire my rows from the origin, I enter my solid at rho equals cosine phi, and I exit my solid at rho equals one. One is the nice description of the larger sphere, but rho equals cosine phi is also a legitimate description of the sphere that sits on top of the origin. Now let's see how this works out. Okay, so I might get into powers of sine and cosine here. So let's try this out. And notice I wrote rho equals cos phi, rho equals one. I could have said phi equals zero to phi equals pi over two. Remember, these are all equations. Limits are always equations. So I first integrate with respect to rho and I get one third rho cubed sine phi. But then I have to evaluate from rho equals cos phi to rho equals one. And then when I survive that, I'll integrate with respect to phi and then with respect to theta. So when I plug in my rows here, I get one third of sine phi and I get one third of cos cubed sine phi. Phi is the angle I'm using in both cases. D phi, D theta. I mean, I think I can integrate this. I think it's gonna be a generic U substitution, but let's be as efficient as possible. It actually be more efficient to break out a minus sine phi and set it over here. Then I'll write my d theta in red. And then concentrate on what's left after I take out the minus sine phi. Oh, I'm sorry, move the paper up. This is page number six. Because then I'm left with a cosine cubed of phi. And here I'm left with a minus one. You say, don't forget about the one third. Uh, I always mess up constants. If I bring the constant outside the integral, then I usually always forget to apply the constant at the end. Well, let's practice that. Let's practice pulling out this one third, setting it outside the integral so I don't have to think about fractions. But what I have here is minus cos cubed sine of phi sine phi, that's that one. And I have plus sine phi, that's that piece. Okay, good. Now, the reason I do it this way is because then I'm gonna let u equal the cosine of phi and du equal minus sine phi d phi. And that gives me u cubed minus one here. And it gives me just a straight du because I brought the minus sign over here. Now remember, this is from phi equals zero to phi equals pi over two. I prefer to go back to phi and then put those limits in. Someday I'll give you an example of why it's dangerous to only switch the limits. And then don't forget the one third out here. So this integral right here is one fourth u fourth minus u, that's that integral. Now we're going to excate from zero to pi over two. Oh, oh, right. But I didn't put my cosine back, did I? And so this is because I was looking at powers of pi and saying, what's going on with powers of pi? One fourth cosine phi minus cosine 
phi. Got it. Zero to pi over two. And then d theta. Zero to two pi. That's going to be a nice constant integral. And then one third out front. Okay, so now let's keep track of this. And with a pi over two insertion, I get this big, big break, don't I? That's why I look for these nice limits. Zero, pi over two, pi, and two pi, because cosine of pi over two is zero. So both those turn out to be zero when I insert pi over two. And now when I insert zero, cosine of zero is nice, it's give me a one. So it give me a one quarter minus one. which is minus three quarters. Now, don't panic with the numbers yet until we investigate things fully. But basically I have one third. Oh, notice it's a minus minus three quarters. So that's a positive three quarters. Zero to two pi, d theta. Now, what is this? One third, constant outside, three quarters, constant inside over the interval zero to two pi. So let's check this out. Cancel the thirds, cancel two over four, gives me a two on the bottom, this is pi over two. Which is what we thought it was gonna be from a physical point of view at the beginning. So this was a, integration that could not be expressed nicely in rectangular or spherical coordinates, uh, rectangular or cylindrical coordinates, excuse me. Now you might rightfully say, yeah, but it was a simple bubble inside half a ball. I mean, you didn't need to do any integration to figure that out. Yes, that's true. But if I had modified one of those in some non-trivial way, then I would have had to work out the volume overall and the volume I was subtracting. Maybe that would have required geometry formulas that I was not familiar with. In the end, many things are reduced to geometry formulas, right? Where do the geometry formulas come from? They come from someone who went through the actual integration. Four thirds pi r cubed the uh, earlier, the one third pi r squared h for a cone height, right? All those things in the end come from integration. Okay, so there's some example of cylindrical and spherical coordinates. I wanna say a word about mass and center of mass before we stop today. I'm not gonna do a lot of mass, center of mass, moment of inertia problems, because you know I don't wanna step on the fun of your physics teachers or your engineering teachers, but I do want you to see it from the proper perspective, which is always the proper perspective is the mathematical perspective. So let me give you a little introduction to center of mass here. And then I will also do some example, maybe another example next time, maybe we'll talk briefly about moment of inertia. But center of mass, it's easy to identify the center of mass of objects. If you think of center of mass as the average value of an appropriate function. And the same thing with moments of inertia. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna to go to that handout first and then we might do some calculation, but I just want to spend, you know, five or 10 minutes introducing this and maybe an example next time too. 
So I want to pull up my center of mass handout. I think I'll do that locally so I can make that larger as I will. Uh, and then I'll share this with you. So I got my handout here. I'm gonna share screen. And, oops, no, no, wrong button in meeting. That's not a smart idea. So I'm just making sure I've got everything pinned at the right place. Let's do it. Okay, so now you are looking at the center of mass handout from my website. We can do some scribbling on it. So let's think about this. I want you to read this handout carefully, but I could just give you some clues on how to read it. And that is, you've balanced things from your earliest experience of life. First thing you learned to balance was your own body, right? And that's called walking. When did you experience walking? Well, I don't know what the whole giant range is. Could be 10 months to two years, kind of. Uh, 10 months is early, two years. I don't, it's been too long for me to remember. Maybe two years is a little bit late. I think commonly 18 months is when people get the hang of walking. So you've been doing it for a long time. That's a pretty sophisticated three-dimensional balancing act. So let's take it back to the very beginning. And that is, you've also balanced things on scales. You know that if you put a mass out here, four units away from the fulcrum of a balance, and you give it a certain mass and you want to balance it with something closer to the fulcrum, you know that this thing close to the fulcrum is going to have to have a larger mass. And actually, it's not hard to calculate what the mass is. Let's say a mass of three, that's four units from the fulcrum, has to be balanced by a mass of two, of six, that's two units from the fulcrum. And they both exert a twisting on the fulcrum. And the mass on the left is causing the scale to twist counterclockwise, you know, causing this ruler to turn counterclockwise about the fulcrum. The mass on the right would tend to make the scale rotate clockwise. You're trying to balance the counterclockwise and the clockwise rotation. And this tendency to rotate about the fulcrum is called a moment. It's called the first moment. And all you have to do is make the product of the distance from the fulcrum and the mass equal on both sides. Three times four is six times two. And what that is, is you are summing the first moments, <coughs> excuse me, and it doesn't matter which you call positive, which you call negative. I'm not going to get into counterclockwise, clockwise, positive, negative, but one of them is opposing the other, no doubt. And when you sum the first moments, if the sum of the first moments is zero, then the system is not experiencing rotation. So I want you to take this matching first moments and I want you to fancy it up. So look at the three times four, six times two. That's like saying three times four plus six times minus two is zero. But the four and the minus two are representing what? Distance from the fulcrum, five minus one is four, five minus seven is minus two. So what you're doing is taking the masses three and six and multiplying them from the distance of the center of mass at the fulcrum. Now, if you consider the fulcrum to be the center of this mass, if it's balanced, let's call that X bar, you realize that the formula you created, three times five minus one plus six times five minus seven is zero, is actually a formula for the center of mass. 
three times x bar minus one plus six times x bar minus seven. If you did not know what x bar was, you could solve that for x bar. And what do you get? Three times one plus six times seven over three plus six. The three plus six you recognize as the sum of the masses, but what's the three times one plus the six times seven? Well, you see the position of the three and the six are one and seven, but one and seven relative to what? Relative to the origin zero over here, which we didn't pay attention to at all before. But now let's think about it this way. If I did not know that the center of mass was at five, if I did not know that that's where I should put the fulcrum, well, every point is arbitrarily equally important to me, right? So what I could do is choose the origin to be the center of my universe and measure the moments from the origin. So three times one plus six times seven is a measurement of the moments from the origin. So now this X bar has meaning the X bar could be expressed as what? Sum of masses on the bottom, but sum of moments on the top. And you say, well, the origin is not the center of mass. No, but look how, if I twist that, the sum of the moments divided by the sum of the masses actually gives me what? Three plus 42 is 45. Three plus six is nine. 45 divided by nine is five. So this formula, sum of moments over sum of masses, naturally produces center of mass, five. <laughs> now you pump that up and say, well, what if I had three masses? Same thing, sum of moments over sum of masses produces the center of mass. And you can have some fun doing that with lots of masses. <laughs> giving someone a problem of various masses set at various positions on this ruler, you can always calculate the center of mass by taking sum of moments over sum of masses with this arbitrary setting of the origin. You have to set the origin somewhere. You have to calculate with respect to something, right? But now let's take this to calculus. So what is sum of moments over sum of masses in calculus? Well, we think about this rod, this one dimensional rod as doing what? As having lots of little mass pieces, infinitely many mass pieces, let's call them DMs, a little bit of mass. And where does the little bit of mass come from? Well, it comes from the little bit of length, times the density or mass per unit, per unit length of the object. So if I have mass per unit length, which may be variable, times length, I get mass. A little bit of mass is the density times a little bit of length. And now I can repeat the sum of moments over sum of masses with integrals by saying the sum of moments is the integral of x dm, distance from an arbitrary origin x times a little bit of mass divided by the sums of the little bit of masses. Now this is the sum of the moments over the whole mass of the rod. That's imitating the finite case. And here's a simple example. If I set the density equal to x squared, then I integrate x times x squared. I get a number, I integrate x squared. I get the mass. The sum of the moments or the sum of the masses is 7.5 in this case. And that would be where I would balance this rod if the density increased with the square of x. Now, there's only one thing I don't like about this presentation, and that's a problem with all books, is that books tend to represent density often with row, 
or delta. You get two choices. And both rho and delta mean something important in physical situation. Rho we've used in our spherical coordinates. So I do not like using rho when I talk about density, but the book I was using in this case was using rho. Uh, we're gonna have to investigate what this book says. Often people use delta for density, but that gets them in trouble later when they want to use delta for something else. There's just not enough letters out there for us. So I want to more often use delta for density. I think that gets us into less trouble right now. In the next class, I'm gonna use delta for something special, but we'll wait for that time to happen. So a little bit of mass, so density times a little bit of length. Or if I'm talking about a sheet of metal, the density, a little bit of mass is the density times a little bit of area. Or if I'm talking about a potato in space, interval, region, potato, G for potato, then density is a times a volume element. A little bit of mass is the density times a little bit of volume. So here the density would be a function of x. Here the density would be a function of x and y. Here the density would be a function of x and y and z possibly. But the principle is always the same. Center of mass is the sum of the moments. That's x dm over the sum of the masses, which is just the sum of the dm. Now, if you had to find the center of mass of a region, what you realize is, oh, I have a x center of mass and a y center of mass. So in that case, the x center of mass is a double integral over the region x dm divided by the double integral over the region dm. And that's equal to double integral over the region, x delta dA, because I'm doing double integral area, over double integral over the region delta dA. But the y center of mass will be the moment from the y-axis. And now you realize what's gonna cost you time and pain in any generic, generic center of mass problem is you gotta evaluate multiple, multiple integrals. And so this is something that we usually do with some automation or computer algebra system. But, and then you, now you realize what are you gonna do for three dimensions? Well, then you have X bar, Y bar, Z bar. So what do we do for X bar, Y bar? That's one integral, two integrals, th three integrals. This integral right here, we've already repeated. So I'd need three double integrals to do center of mass of a sheet of metal. And I'll need four double, triple integrals to do the center of mass of a potato. Now, I always get really, really bothered by this. I always goof up this notation, so I gotta be careful when I do this. This x dm is called the moment about the y-axis because when you do for this sheet, the x dm, the x distance is the distance from the y axis. And so the y dm is the distance from the x axis. That's called the moment about the x axis. I always reverse these and it's really easy to reverse because you wanna see an x here, you wanna see an x here. This is a moment about the y-axis, moment about the x-axis. Because I always goof those up, I tend to just say, let's write the integral. 
and I don't like to use notation like this, but notation like this is pretty common. So you have to get used to it. Okay, likewise, if I was doing, oh, okay, and time is, time is gone, time has escaped me, so I apologize. We're gonna end it here, but you could work out what the triple integral should look like, and we'll do an example next time. Okay, I have to pop over to online office hours, which is not in this link meeting. It's in a different link meeting, which is on my website, which you're welcome to come and visit, but I have nearly expired my time, so I'm gonna run over there very quickly. If you have a question, come over there and see me and we'll talk, but I'll get this video going for posting and I'll see you shortly or I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.